This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetacy. I'm Bridget Fetacy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. Our sponsor this week is Fetacy.com. Fetacy.com is an online community for the politically homeless. This week, we welcome Christina Hoff Summers. She's a former philosophy professor and resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. She's one of the Femsplainers on her podcast, Femsplainers. She also has a YouTube series called The Factual Feminist, in which she corrects feminist myths within women's and gender studies with truth and solid research. I'm with Christina Hoff Summers, everyone. Say hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to see me. Well, thank you for coming to see me and visiting, and let's just hope Izzy behaves. <laughs> She's already made a little bit of trouble. She's fine. Your house is exactly what I would have pictured from your online persona. I was I was feeling like, I bet she lives in a literal dollhouse. <laughs> and it does. It does look a little dollhouse. I love it. So tell us about who you are and what you do and... Well, I am a f- the Femsplainer on the podcast Femsplainer, uh, also a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, mm-hmm. and before that, many years a philosophy professor. Oh, okay. And I left that to come to this think tank, AEI, in 1997. I had an opportunity to come because it was like it's like... Being at a university, but no students in the sense of no papers to grade, right. and no, very few meetings to attend. So it was quite liberating. I could just write all the time. And I have I love it. It's, and what is, the, what is the think tank? What do you do there? Well, I'm there as, just as a resident scholar. So I have a, a research assistant, mm-hmm. an intern sometimes. And they just support you in any way you need to do your scholarship. Okay. So I've written a few books, and I've uh, articles. The last few years, I've been focused a lot on social media because you reach such a large audience. I have this right. series called The Factual Feminist. Mm-hmm. It's had millions of views. It's unlike anything I'd ever done before because usually if you publish an article, you're lucky if, I don't know, a few thousand people read it, maybe right. more sometimes. Um, so... I just love YouTube and uh, having the podcast and Twitter and, you know, mo- mostly positive experiences. I even have nice comments you do. on my YouTube videos. <laughs> so is the factual feminist through just you or is it? It's just me. Okay. Uh, sometimes I had my deputy, uh, Caroline Kitchens. Is it your own channel or do you? No, it's the, have I, a- well, I don't know. We, it's, I, you, I do it through the American Enterprise Institute. Oh, okay. But it's posted on youtube so okay just, gotcha so they did they produce it yes they, oh we nice. have a video team ah. i haven't been doing it lately and i should get back to yeah. it because each week initially i would just try to correct a feminist myth okay because i do consider myself a feminist but i think that uh truth and solid research is far more empowering than hyperbole spin exaggeration and there's just a lot of that in women's studies, gender studies, there's just a lot of young women walking around with a distorted picture of our society. And I think that limits those young women. And I think it's just creating rancor and not solving problems. Right. This is kind of how I stumbled upon you. I think you did a video for Prager U. It was about the wage gap. Yes. And you were debunking the myth. And I stumbled kind of into the wilderness of Twitter in 2013, but really didn't stumble into political and culture war Twitter until probably 2015 when I started writing for Playboy. And I was saying this on a po- Matt Lewis's podcast yesterday. I didn't realize that feminism had changed as much as it had from when I had my feminist honors English teacher who kind of drilled in feminine, you know, everyone had their one teacher who right. was a feminist who taught them about it. And I came into Playboy and I wrote my first piece, which was um, there was a piece going around about why men, why I hate giving head and it was getting going viral for Vice. And so I was like, well, someone needs to defend 
<laughs> yeah. blowjobs. <laughs> and so I wrote why I love giving blowjobs. And I got a lot of unexpected pushback about how I was internalizing the patriarchy. Oh, and I, I thought you were going to say you got a lot of uh, it, it, it phone calls and uh, um, marriage proposals. I had never <laughs> even heard of those terms, internalizing the patriarchy. I didn't even know what that meant. And so I was so oblivious to, to it's, this. You know, just think about that. Is saying that to another woman in a society where we all have opportunities to read and think and consider different opinions. It's not like you're saying it about a woman who's been, you know, sequestered and kept behind walls and not educated to say she's internalized, you know, the oppressive world around her. But to say that to a free, self-determined American woman in contemporary society that's so judgmental of the of the feminist to say that about you. It takes away my agency too, which is yeah. my biggest issue, I think, with modern feminism. And not listening that- to your voice and not, you know, j- j- it's just disrespectful and it shows something to me very troublesome, troubling in contemporary feminism, which is too much contempt. Right. And contempt is among the most dangerous emotions it it's the uh conviction the absolute worthlessness of another person Mm -hmm. well that's a very unhealthy frame of mind Mm -hmm. and yet there's just a lot of contempt you now i think it's brought out you know social media has is enabling that uh that negative state of mind i think that it's interesting because i'm in 12 step and we talk a lot about resentment and how it's poisonous and really getting rid of resentment is the one of the number one priorities because it drives you essentially to make bad decisions <laughs> and it eats away at you and it can convince you that you're a victim essentially that those feelings of resentment are so powerful yeah, yeah it convinces you that you're a victim and that others are your victimizer mm-hmm. and then that justifies this anger and these this this resentment as you say and the contempt and that you have to be very careful about any philosophy of life that leads you to be so full of rage towards fellow human beings. Mm-hmm. You know, if we've learned anything from a few thousand years of civilization is that we all should be guided by empathy, mutual understanding, mm-hmm. and even people who go badly wrong, even people who end up in prison for horrible things, there's still a capacity for change, mm-hmm. and I, I, I don't discount the humanity of anyone, and no. I'm willing to listen. I'm not saying people don't have to pay for their crimes. Of course they do, but most people aren't criminals, and even those who are are still human. That is the strange thing about social media is that I feel like we're all reduced to caricatures of ourselves, and so there's this lack of compassion and humanity and so people are treating each other just automatically bad faith interpretations of where they're coming from automatically you'll right. say something and it's like the 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 way that it's interpreted is in the worst possible framing of of anything and i'm guilty i'm sure of doing this to people as well online because it is easy to do yeah i'm trying not to do it um i, I don't think i've ever done it much but the, the piling on and yeah and the, the thing that will get me going is if so, if somebody that I like is being bullied mm-hmm. like there was a time where just to give an example uh, someone I greatly admire Barry Weiss at the New York Times mm-hmm. she was they were just pummeling her and blue checked oh know, yeah Twitter journalists they go after Barry we're going after her and it just made me so mad mm-hmm. and that gets me going and <laughs> I want to say mean things um, but other than that I try not to they go after jordan peterson a lot too it seems oh yes a lot i mean he's had a lot of think pieces written about him and the amazing thing with him is how different it is to meet him and talk to him or hear him and then see how he's caricatured by Mm -hmm. so many journalists and i wonder if they've even listened to him i I mean they they may have but they just went there with the frame of mind they were just looking to tear right. him apart. Because the thing about him is he doesn't even talk about politics that much. He's more um, Philo- philosophical. philosophical. Mm-hmm. And I think his appeal is that he's, he's sort of a 
uh, he has a dramatic flair. <laughs> and I think, I haven't found that he's that different in person as he is in public. That's who he is. Mm-hmm. He's very engaged and very um, troubled by you know various existential crises. Mm-hmm. He takes them seriously. And I think that's that's very attractive to especially a lot of young people because the college curriculum can be fairly uh, alienating. It is. And you it, you don't have teachers like Peterson that mm-hmm. much anymore. I had mm-hmm. a few. Well, I think what Jordan Peterson does is he shows, he can um, take an audience to fundamental questions about mm-hmm. human existence, mm-hmm. about m- human mortality. And he emphasizes the the danger and the drama and just the high stakes that we face as mortal beings. And um, I I'm just think it's, fen- it's fascinating to a lot of young people. And he emphasizes your personal responsibility mm-hmm. to take advantage of this gift that mm-hmm. we don't fully understand, maybe never will, take advantage of your opportunities and not be a deadbeat. And a lot of young men needed to hear that, and young women. But I young think he's men, especially, really. especially effective with young men. Mm-hmm. And so many say he, that he turned their their lives around. Oh, I definitely have heard this writing for Playboy and for Men, Primary Mel Magazine as well. Both are male publications, and so I hear a lot from that population, and I cannot tell you how many people have said that he has changed their life right. and reframed their worldview. And I feel like the 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 females of that generation seem to me much more certain but they're i don't understand where that leads them the mentality that they're certain about of the patriarchy is in everything and we need to tear it down yeah what's the end game here what is the end game what and I always ask this. I tell I that's always my question is okay play that tape forward where are we going with this if you're constantly oppressed by this whatever invisible <laughs> system of subordination that most of us don't see, thank you very much. We don't see it. I see the opposite. I see a society where w- just women have unprecedented freedom, opportunity, and in many ways are doing better than men. Instead of being oh, yeah. oppressed by them, we've actually moved ahead in education. And, you know, we live longer. We probably have more choices in how we live our lives. And this is not acknowledged. No. They are so fixated on the war on women narrative. They will not give it up. And they, I mean, I say they, but I'm talking about the organized women's movement mm-hmm. and the sort of dominant voices in gender mm-hmm. studies mm-hmm. and on uh, sort of feminist s- social media. Do you have a theory about why this is? Why has the narrative... Why I'm I'm just so curious about and it I'm fascinated with it because I do feel like I stumbled into the culture war, and as I was saying, I I come from Gen X. It's very much empowered, and then this empowerment took this shift to victimhood. Yeah, well, it's been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. It's been around for almost as long as I can remember <laughs> since I was a graduate student in in the last century. But it was confined to sort of out of the way places on right. college campus and maybe in a few bookstores. There would be some feminist bookstores. Right. <laughs> and that was it. And it was not taken that seriously. It is now taken seriously because this, the craziness got tenure. And then they're just, I guess, a critical mass of young women took it seriously. And for whatever reason, got you know uh, it, it, it came to power these bad ideas it's so interesting power. to me because i don't find the ideas remotely appealing so that is always my question to the young women who are online and they're generally in their late 20s early 30s and they're bloggers or fr- i have a lot of friends comedians even and they believe this hook line and sinker but i don't see what is it? I I constantly want to know what is appealing about this. I know, philosophy. you know, I wonder the same thing, and I sometimes 
What am and I filled with so- self doubt because I think, <laughs> right, <laughs> maybe I have internalized the patriarchy. Or, and you know, <laughs> I, I feel the same way. I question, but then it makes me happy when I meet women like you and and Claire Lehman and just you know so many others, um, Heather Hang, because her. then it makes me feel less. Uh, I, I just worry less about being blind or maybe I'm suffering from confirmation bias. But here's the thing. Here's why I think we're on the right path. If you ask these women what draws you to this, it will usually lead to a recitation of uh, uh, facts about the state of women in society. And they'll start with the wage gap. You know, we're being cheated out of, uh, you know, like, 23% of our salaries or 27% of our salary that we one in two is battered and one in four raped and our self-esteem diminished in adolescence and we, our voice is taken away. Just this endless litany of Grievances. misery and mm-hmm. grief and grievance. And what I try to do in the factual feminist and in actually most of my published work on feminism is I tried to evaluate the accuracy of these claims. Mm-hmm. And in almost every case, what I found was they were wildly exaggerated, sometimes distorted, sometimes a complete misrepresentation of reality. Mm-hmm. But if you believe these things, imagine yourself a sensitive young woman, come to you know freshman year, your teachers are telling you the truth, the hidden you know horrors behind reality. And that this is the world that women inhabit. Now, maybe something bad happened to you. Um, then you can, you know, think, oh, well, that wasn't just something bad that happened to me. That was actually part of a, my systemic oppression. Mm-hmm. And it just seems like a lot of young women are willing to do that mm-hmm. and get very angry, believe the worst about men, mm-hmm. and... Too often they become humorless, judgmental, bitter. Bitter. They start making themselves un- as unattractive as possible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, just I've seen beautiful young women just you know in full uh, rebellion mm-hmm. against uh, patriarchal standards of beauty. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny because in my experience, women are much harder on women than men are. Of course. <laughs> these, but see, these are the inconvenient truths. Even studies on insults and so forth on Twitter, it's mostly women trashing other women. The women on Twitter have been much nastier to me to than me the men. To me too. Other than the incels. But the extreme feminists and the incels, basically, I, they're interchangeable. Oh, exactly. Or the far, these, some of the kooks in the, in the men's right movement right, right. remind me. Mm-hmm. Of, and they, they remind me of the hardline feminists. Oh, and yeah. they have their own exaggerated statistics. And they just say the opposite. Oh, it's men who are the subordinate class. Mm-hmm. And, you know what? This is the United States of America. And there are problems. Every group, identity group has its problems. Some worse than others, obviously. But overall, it is a society that's doing so much to overcome the bigotries of the past and to offer opportunities to people, educational mm-hmm. opportunities, and a population of people, especially younger people, that just are not burdened with the prejudice of f- former times. Yeah. So you find the least racist, the least homophobic. Oh, yeah. Um, they don't- least anti-Semitic. Well, I don't know. Anti-Semitism seems to be having a comeback. But even that, it's it's uh, constrained to you know, fairly small group. So mm-hmm. I just, I, again, like you say, you ask, you don't know why some of these feminist friends of yours, why they see the world the way they do. And I feel that about a lot of sort of hardline liners on the left who have such a negative view of the free market. Capitalism. Of, of, yeah. yeah. And end of our democracy. Whole, <laughs> yeah. Democracy. I, I never, I grew up never, I mean, to me it was a given that we would, you know, just protect free expression. I know. And due process. And just our democratic tradition, we're so lucky to have. The and people method. fought and died for us to have it. And then we just, you know, you see, I hear, again, it's not a majority, but 
there are feminists on campus who talk to me and argue with me and who just look at our system and say, tear it down, you know, right. they, and they think they're living in the handmaid's day. Right. It's interesting because I wonder, I was, did you read Jonah Goldberg's newest book? Oh, the I Suicide love it. of the West. Yes. And he's at, he's at my Institute. Oh God. He's so brilliant. My ho- I'm staying right down the street from it. Actually. Um, he's so brilliant, brilliant. And just the overall theme of the lack of gratitude that we have in right. general. And I just wonder, I cannot help but wonder when I, when I look at the younger generations who are less tolerant of free speech, who are feeling like everything is crap. Do they, do we just have too much? Is it, is it time? Is this a cycle that humans go through where we just get to a point where we have so much and then we can't handle it and just throw it all away? I don't know, but I, I agree with what you say. Uh, I, I strongly recommend Jonah Goldberg's book, and he's just fun to listen to. He's he has so, his podcast. I know he's just so. I heard him speak when he was in L.A. about his book and the. His ability to just pull knowledge and facts, historical facts, and historical and anecdotes. from popular culture, I know. and every every uh, episode the, of the, the Twilight Zone. Or, I know <laughs> he I know. is. He's darling. Every place I go to speak, I go to colleges, and they say, "Who else should we have?" I say, "Jonah Goldberg." Oh yeah, he's <laughs> because he is so. Um, and I feel like this. I wish that every. I feel like every student who's reading. I don't know whatever they're reading. That's- Howard Zinn, you know, this very negative history of the United mm-hmm. States. For a while, oh, excuse me, <coughs> it was one of the most popular history books. Okay. And it's completely, even, even left-wing historians think that it's junk, but it's um, it, it's assigned even in high schools. Wow. it's. I just don't, and what's interesting too is the generation, the generation <laughs> after whatever this, gen- the millennials, the I Jen, they're great. <laughs> I they give me a lot of hope. Oh, I, maybe you were talking about the, like high school students. My, right now? I just did a round table with my my friends' kids. They are ten to eighteen, ten, fourteen, and eighteen boys, and they're pretty apolitical and oblivious. They're just normal kids. They're hilarious about all this stuff. They don't care about any of it. They just think that it's all silly and i asked them what they thought about the election and they said i don't know everybody seems to be really butthurt about it and (laughs) from their perspective everybody above them the generation above them is insane and and outraged all the time they're already kind of making fun of the outrage of the generation above them they see that that they have you know it's just human to rebel right and especially to rebel against these scolds it's like we've been taken over by hall monitors from right. junior high, you know, the kids that were teacher's <laughs> pet right. and would turn you in. And now they're, you know, they're the they're the comedians. It's crazy. And they're the journalists, and they just took this nonsense too seriously, and they're bitter. So, but here's my worry, though, about your nephews. I, I hope that's the attitude of the of, their, of the girls they know as well. Yeah, see, that's what I'm wondering. I don't because, know about you know, the girls. Because, you know, what girls want, you know, the boys will often go along with it because it's uh, boys, uh, you know, we hear, oh, well, toxic masculinity, they want to dominate and, you know, prey on, on women and girls. Mm. Actually, the vast majority of them want the love of women. And if the women... Be, young women are initiated into this cult of grievance and chronic offense taking and hostility to men um the the men will just go silent or they will a few of them will join in Mm -hmm. with feminists and then others will be alienated i mean it's it's we've created uh we're passing down i think a legacy of division and uh, hostility between the sexes which Mm -hmm. is terrible that is interesting. I and I talk a lot about this as this new, which is weird because it's a, it seems like it's a new battle of the sexes. But then there's the whole battle of what the sexes are <laughs> that's kind of layered on top. Oh, of it. there's that. Yeah, so, which seems to be inconsistent. Totally too. inconsistent. And so I, it's like gender is a social social construct. But I'm actually, but women need more rights and are oppressed. But now I'm actually a woman. I I can't. It's mind-bending. It is, and 
the thing is, uh, they, the theorists behind this uh, do not typically wish to debate critics. So there, a lot of these ideas that are passed along in the gender studies textbooks have never really gone through any kind of rigorous peer review. Oh, no kidding. I mean, I interviewed James Lindsay from <laughs> the the grievance studies, and yes. it's insane what they got passed through. It It's appalling. And <laughs> you know what's really sad is I look at these professors who, you know, write about these arcane issues and, you know, the gender politics of Starbucks uh uh, pumpkin lattes and what that says about white supremacy and this, you know, these ridiculous articles, these are real, not mm, even made up. Mm. And so they occupy a position in a university, let's say in an English department, where you might once have had a professor that would teach students how to write, mm -hmm. that would focus on the mechanics of language, that would expose them to the great, great writers and show them how to become a better stylist and better communicator. Now they go in, and this happened to my ne one of my nephews. He went in to take a late bloomer, but very bright kid, and he went in, and his one of his first college classes, they had to read women's oppression literature. Right. And it didn't interest him. It didn't interest me. I was trying to go help him with the books, and it was just oppressive to have right. to read these, these poorly written books. <laughs> Ironically. <laughs> and what a waste of... An opportunity, mm -hmm. and it doesn't last very long. Sometimes it's, you know, it's, maybe someone's getting an AA degree. It's just two years. Those are precious years. You can have a few liberal arts courses, but increasingly those liberal arts courses are going to be just indoctrination mm -hmm. into this tedious identity politics or identity, seeing literature all in terms of identity. I mean, identity is there, of course, right? But so is beauty and a, a philosophy it's just so many things and they it's such a narrowing of human experience mm -hmm. and i just feel like there's a whole generation of kids that have been cheated out of their rightful inheritance you know of the great works well because they're they're all white men so they exactly. can't read them anymore <laughs> but that you know what the idea of liberation is not that you uh you're liberated and now you don't have to read these bad men. No, you're liberated and now you can read the great great thoughts and stand on the shoulders of the the brilliant figures in the past and appreciate them and enjoy them, have access to them. I mean, a, a book that I loved so much was uh, Reading Lolita in Tehran. Mm -hmm. um, this she this uh, the author had been a professor in Tehran and was secretly teaching some, the great books of which oh, she loved wow. and, and uh, literature, and so people would have to sneak to an apartment to read the books. Wow! And we take it for granted we that do. we can read these books. We do. And we take a lot for granted. We take running water for granted. We take hot running water for granted. I was. I say this probably a hundred times on my podcast. I think one of the biggest problems with Americans is that they don't travel enough. They don't get out and see other cultures. And I don't mean going to Europe and and your your semester abroad. I mean get a backpack and go to a country where you have to figure out the train system and see. I just did a podcast with Cassie Dillon, who's been. Ex she's traveled extensively. She went to. Iraq or somewhere. Yeah. And that she was, was she's brave. She's so <laughs> brave. This little girl, she's a young woman with the biggest balls. I mean, she she was young when she did this. She was young when I she's 25, I think, when I interviewed a couple weeks ago and she must have been 22 or 21 when she did this. It was she's so bold and that's that is the that has been really exciting for me doing these podcasts and interviewing young women is that they do seem more engaged and the libertarian conservative women seem to be bold and bright and on top of it i interviewed liz wolf she's um in austin but she writes for the federalist and playboy she has that same weird yeah, yeah. byline that i have <laughs> and she's 23 or 24 and just so bright and articulate and 
all about personal responsibility and brave and has traveled and seen actual oppression in other countries yeah. and gives you a perspective. When I hear women talking about being oppressed here, I'm like, go to the go to Egypt, go just take a trip to Egypt and see how free you feel wearing a tank top because you can't, you can't do that or go to India and check out what it's like to be a woman there and see how you cannot leave after dark because they will basically in their brains <laughs> when I was there, the men were like, well, if you're out late, you're just asking to be raped, yeah, right? Just, that, that's just saying you want me. Yeah, <laughs> that's I'm basically here, yeah. their mentality. <laughs> and it's it's fascinating to observe, but also we don't realize how that is not the mentality here. When that men aren't just out looking for a woman to rape it after dark everywhere you go. And that's not ingrained in their brains that that's what women are asking for. Yeah. So it's just interesting to see this perceived sense of persecution. It's it this perceived sense of persecution. And this it's, exists on the right too. I mean, there's definitely this is not just limited to the left. I see. Yeah, except the the thing with the right is that it's not in in the educational system. Right. Except exactly. to a very limited degree in certain maybe religious colleges, but in the mainstream educational system, the public schools, it does not have a foothold, thank God, but the left does. Right. So the in the universities, these young women are learning this, and I think what's happened is whatever, it, it was a, a twisted worldview, but that twisted worldview has become a kind of moral panic. Right. So I think what we're seeing is a contagion of hysteria. <laughs> And people believe, and they just, I can see it in their eyes. I know, I know. And it's just, just a funny word too, around. because it's like hysterias. I'm like, these women are hysterical. And we're like, no, 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 but they are. I know, I know. <laughs> I, I was giving a lecture and I did say something like that in a, 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 a young woman stood and said, I really wish you wouldn't use the word hysteria. Oh no, this was in, this was in <laughs> Australia with the uh, wonderful... Roxanne. Roxanne Gay debates. And this young woman said, I wish you wouldn't use the word hysteria. And I said, but it is. it's apt. It describes mm -hmm. there is a contagion. There's no way to explain why young women at Harvard would think that they live in a rape culture <laughs> and that they are at risk because the dean of their dormitory is, you know, oh, a lawyer representing a, a Harvey Weinstein and therefore... They're at risk. Um, I'm sorry. First of all, I, I look back at college. I was at New York University in a dormitory on Fifth Avenue. And there was some guy on the 12th floor, Dr. Gennaro and his wife, who were our dorm counselors. We never knew who they were. Right. And did not wish to. Right. And they, I'm not sure they wanted to know who we were. They right. were. I don't even know why they were there. I think they may have got rid of having such a thing a few years later. It's probably just so they could have housing. Yeah, and it was fine. But now that it's as if college students are infantilized, and so there has to be mommy and daddy, and they want to see, you know, not to be upset. And if they're upset, they'll have a temper tantrum, and they're behaving. It's almost as if college kids are behaving the way you would think of elementary school right. kids. The whole notion of I don't feel safe being given as much power as it's given is frightening to it's me. It's frightening, and it's it's a, a powerful force against freedom right now. Exactly. Because it's women. I've watched this happen on social media. There was this false claim that women were being just ruthlessly harassed on social media. There have been several studies, mostly the ones I take most seriously by the Pew Research Center, and they find that a small percentage of people have very horrible experiences online. More men than women, slightly more men than women. More mm -hmm. men get physical threats mm -hmm. than women. Women get more sexually harassed, but it's below all below 10%. Mm -hmm. So, but the women who are harassed are react worse to it than men. So they're more, uh, they complain about it more and talk about it more. So we develop this idea that there is this uh, epidemic mm -hmm. of abuse. And then Amnesty International did this absurd study claiming that the mistreatment of women on Twitter 
is a pressing human rights issue. Oh, I saw this. It was it was a joke <laughs> as, in, as in terms of methodology. Mm-hmm. There was no methodology. Mm-hmm. It was it, and they didn't ask men. They only asked women. Right. That's always a trick if you want to do advocacy research. You know, don't have a comparison group. Just ask the group about whom you want to, you know, uh, advocate for. Yeah. Right. And then advocate and then if people have this mission they want to show they want to find the smoking gun that shows women are oppressed and they lose their standards they lose their critical faculties Mm -hmm. and produce these fake studies there was one by the un that was so bad that it had to be withdrawn this was Uh, a few years ago i made a factual feminist about that and then this twitter one i mean the amnesty international study and Someone came out with one recently that was equally absurd. So there are no, but but these studies have driven Facebook and Twitter and other platforms, YouTube. Well, that's part of Google, but mm-hmm. they've driven them to uh, overreact. Mm-hmm. Now, some of the changes made on Twitter initially, I thought were good. I mean, just you know, more effective systems for blocking people, mm-hmm. and if people were being abusive, they could right. But um, now what's happened is you can be, there it, There are stories of people being thrown off Twitter for just saying things they believe are true, that they're not being abusive, but just questioning whether a woman can be a man. I mean, wasn't there a leftist woman, Megan, who something yes, Megan was Murphy. Th- for thrown off for saying boys and girls are different? Wasn't yeah. she banned? What was she banned for? Well, she. I think she was banned because, uh, is she back on? I don't know. I'm not I think sure. she may not be back on. I feel like she got permanently <laughs> yeah. suspended. She was permanently suspended, I think. But that doesn't always mean that you are. So I'm not sure if she's back on or not. I know she's written about it. I haven't read the piece she wrote about um I don't I don't really un- fully understand why. I did read something that said she was doing it, Twitter said she was engaging in other spammy behavior, but that's what they say kind of about anybody that they want to suspend. Yeah, well she well, I, I get all the cases mixed up, but let's just say that they went too far and overreacted. But it's because of these of women overstating their vulnerability. Mm. So that's affected social media. Then you look at many journals. You look at places like the New York Times, New York Magazine, Slate. Slate, for example, used to have comments on every article and they were the slate readers are pretty smart i used to enjoy them and then they disappeared and i found out from an unnamed source that the women especially younger women found it very frightening that people were so you know mean in the comments and if you look at comments most of them are respectful and occasionally there'll be a troll who's insulting and and uh, abusive that's very much the exception, but they will collect those and then hold them up. This is what I suffered, and they won't mention that 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 they wrote something you know maybe that was very, uh, you know, uh, controversial, and they got a lot of pushback. Most of it respectful, but a little bit was critical, and then you know, I mean, a little bit was abusive, and then they overreact and go to their boss and say, you know, are you you know. What are you doing to protect an environment? You know, this is a hostile environment. Right. And so increasingly there are young women journalists at these places I mentioned, and their bosses are kind of afraid of them mm-hmm. because they have this power mm-hmm. of, wep- they've weaponized their their victim status. Mm-hmm. So they're not victims, and but they, it's a power play, right? And I'm watching it happen. I've been watching it happen. What's so ironic and and just so crazy to me is that these I'll see the same journalists talking about how women are harassed online are the ones who will pile on Barry Weiss, for instance. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't, or a conservative writer they don't agree with. So they can and they will go hard to the point that Barry Weiss is trending. You know, she was in Vanity Fair and she was recently trending, and it made them so mad. And <laughs> I saw all the people piling on her, yeah. and these are the same people who are constantly talking about how women are harassed online, male and female journalists on the left. And I'm like, you guys are you are doing this to a journalist? And they 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 harass to the point of the the trolls, the left-wing trolls anyway, 
go after people's jobs. Mm -hmm. And well, some right wingers have done that too. They but, do that but, too. It, but the uh, left wingers, or whatever they are, I don't. I don't even, even know the categories yeah, anymore. I think maybe as the uh, far yeah, left. Yeah, maybe therapeutic progressives. Or there's some <laughs> word I'm looking for because I used to be a progressive. Progress meant freedom and liberation and mm -hmm. flourishing and mm -hmm. having fun and humor and bringing more people. I mean, a social justice meant making available to as many people as possible mm -hmm. um, a free uh, and just rich life with opportunities and now they're redefining it and in ways which aren't so much stressing our common humanity but stressing our group and and a common enemy mm. so we go from common humanity which is which is humanism that i believe in mm -hmm. to the common enemy which is tribalism mm -hmm. which is scary it is scary. and it's scary because it comes so naturally i know and, and that's what a lot of undergraduates don't understand. You go into a class, you go into a school, and they start dividing you by race mm -hmm. and you know emphasizing your identity and thinking that's progress. It's the it is reactionary, and it's appealing to something that resonates within mm -hmm. us. It's in our DNA to be tribal and suspicious of outsiders. Mm -hmm. And it took hundreds of years of civilization, and it, 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 it we're not even there yet. To get people to overcome the tribalism and the uh, antipathy to the other and see us as, you know, common humanity. And they're undoing it before it's our so eyes. Crazy. It's crazy, too, because anybody who seems to be in the, I would say you're in the intellectual dark web, people like me who are just more centrist than nature, it, there is an attack on centrism. An oh, attack yeah. on critical thinking, an attack on somebody like me, for instance, who goes after both sides. I there was a tweet I was reading you earlier, some, and I hear this all the time: is that basically, if you're a centrist, you've chosen the side of the oppressor, which <laughs> is that's terrifying to me. That people are being it's terrifying out that, of that, that they've get, they're so closed minded because the most probably the most dangerous frame of mind is the belief. That you, you are absolutely right. That you can't be wrong. It, it and you. That's another thing. I mean, be careful of any life philosophy. Not only that leads you to have contempt for other people, but a life philosophy that that where you stop questioning. Mm -hmm. Because if you just I think it was uh, the physicist uh, Richard Feynman that said that he's not afraid of of answers. He's not afraid of questions that can't be answered. He's afraid of answers that can't be questioned. And there's so many answers now. These people won't question. They've just, you know, and then they will judge you because you haven't reached the same conclusion they have. Mm. This is, um, it's all very w worrisome. It is worrisome. <laughs> because it, it's, uh, you know, history is just one long lesson in the dangers of dogma mixed with moral zealotry, mixed with, you know, distortion, bad information, it leads to fanaticism. And I see that on campus. I mm. see it on social media. And I don't think the liberals who have the power to correct it are correcting it because mm. they're intimidated by it. Mm. I mean, I would tell you the majority of professors are liberal. We know mm. that. They are not dogmatic hardcore uh progressives but they are intimidated by mm -hmm. the hardcore and it puts it can put them at risk if they challenge mm -hmm. them oh yeah i mean and this is true in journalism maybe the majority are liberal um uh, old school liberals and they just believed in free speech and you know you can make jokes and all and now they're afraid of the younger people i wonder who are, why they're afraid well because they've seen their friends lose jobs right Right. One slip. And you have a, you know, an angry millennial woman in your office. You're like a 45 year old man. And she, let's say you have a debate about something and you, you're the guy and she feels that you, you know, you were disrespectful because just because you challenged, I mean, we know, right. I know that when you challenge the ideas of some of these dogmatic young feminists, um, they consider you uh, to have committed violence. 
Now, let's suppose you're a guy. And, and so she feels now that you've created a hostile environment because I was talking about, you know, the rape culture and he didn't take it seriously. And that's undermining, you know, and she can go and report him. And then he has to go to his boss or someone who's going to be told that, you know, please be more careful, mm -hmm. you know, what you say. And then he has to censor himself. But what did he do? We're not talking about harassment here. We're right. just talk, taking an, an unpopular opinion. That I don't feel safe. It's, yeah. it's scary. It's scary. And we've got to start uh, challenging. Uh, but it's hard to do it because if you challenge someone who doesn't feel safe, then you're, you look like a bully. <laughs> and, and I will tell you, and this is what makes me mad as a woman, and why this is dangerous for us, this whole victim feminism, is because in a humane society, people are sympathetic to, to um, children, to women. You know, if you have a society where there's no protection of children, or women, you, you're, that society is probably um, a rogue state, you know, right. in, in terrible trouble. So <laughs> it's kind of a measure of... Um, enlightenment that people develop uh, protective instincts towards those who are weaker and children are weaker than adults women are weaker on average than mm -hmm. men so you want to have a uh, cultivate protectiveness we have that it's very uh, i think deeply en entrenched and they have turned that the hardline feminists have turned that to their own advantage and they're using it to advance their politics and their ideas, and in increase their power by playing on people's nervousness towards, especially men's nervousness towards, you know, challenging a woman or being, you know, the, the, the possibility that he could be in, accused of being insensitive. Mm. So, and men, most men want to be respectful and want to be nice. And now to be respectful and nice, you have to just, you know, keep quiet and listen and believe what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't want a it's world so, where a man so has to believe what I'm saying. I want him to be able to challenge me and right. argue with me and right. joke with me. Right. And make, you know, and we can make fun of each other. It's just that, that whole mentality of be quiet, listen to what I say and believe me is like uh, totalitarian. <laughs> I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. We just like to laugh and dance while the world burns. Yes. And fantasy.com is where you can do it. For $5 a month, you can join and work out with me and some of the ladies of Phetasy. You can post your true thoughts and not be afraid to be shamed or mocked. You can even post pictures of recipes and get accolades. You can also watch the unedited version of Dumpster Fire, which is posted every Sunday before the actual Dumpster Fire launches. There's a lot going on in there. It's a lovely, supportive group of people who have mm -hmm. made like ec real life friendships. Yeah, they have. They meet in real life now. Uh huh. And we also have a bi monthly drop ins welcome every other Friday. We get together for a little mocktail cocktail session and just try and keep each other sane in this crazy, crazy time we're living in. So join the community at fetacy.com. There is no promo code because pony up $5, people. It's not that much. <laughs> <laughs> and if you like listening to walk-ins welcome and enjoy our content this is an easy way to support us and you also get a whole community of like-minded thinkers out of it matt damon was told off by mini driver because he he dared to he, he totally supports the me too movement he right. said he, this was an interview on abc a few months back he totally supports it and he thought it was very important but then he said but you know we do have to have some proportion you know proportional punishment so not every crime is the same so you know you know uh, an al franken isn't harvey oh, weinstein right. and many drivers says he's part of the problem and they're ever it's all bad it's not not one thing isn't worse than the other it's all equally bad no it's not equally bad <laughs> and al franken is not a harvey weinstein and and that what she's saying, what Minnie Driver and others who supported her 
were say was it was incoherent. Actresses are insane. Actresses they're, they're are insane. insane. <laughs> I saw I saw Alyssa Milano's tweet about the sex strike, and then I joked. I was like, "Someone tell Alyssa Milano's husband to call me." Oh yeah, I, I, and, <laughs> and and because it's just such a weird and ridiculous kind of idea. Have the men that support you be punished because it didn't make sense. Then yesterday. Um, Emily Radajkaus, I don't even know how to, she's like the supermodel. She's gorgeous. She got naked. She did a whole naked photo shoot in protest of the abortion ban. <laughs> oh, and all that's guys, punishing. And all the guys were like, no, stop, please don't. <laughs> there was, uh, that reminds me, there like, was you some. You guys are insane. <laughs> what kind of mixed message Some is woman, this? I forget who she was, a blogger wanted to punish men because She'd been on dating sites and received some dick pit, dick pics. <laughs> Can't even say that. It's not my generation. We didn't have them, but <laughs> now you have. Them. She wanted to punish them, and so she sent. What do you call them? Shots of her intimate anatomy. So she would go on one of these dating sites and then send the guy these, and and she was shocked because instead <laughs> of blocking her, they were. They, you know, everybody wanted to. See her. <laughs> yeah. So it's like these young women don't understand that um, this is not a way to punish men. And no. they aren't exactly what the average heterosexual female is not the same as the typical heterosexual no. male. We have slightly different um, interests and uh, preferences. And, but I think they are convinced that we're exactly the same. We're interchangeable. No. You know, it's just patriarchy that made us think men and women are different. No. And you you walk into the world thinking that you're just running into going to run into trouble. They've done studies too. The whole stuff around sex is so confused, and that's interesting to me because they've done studies that show, for instance, something really simple: men generally fall asleep right after they orgasm. And there's I forget what the evolution. And women want to talk, and you know. women want to snuggle, or Penny they'll for get, your thoughts. or it's like the first orgasm for a woman is kind of like round one. <laughs> you know, it gets her, it gives her energy. So we have very different biological reactions to a, a, a similar feature. <laughs> and it's the denial of that kind of stuff to me that is is so frustrating because I don't know how to fight or debate somebody who's trying to tell me that that those biological differences don't exist. It's very frustrating because they're so sure. They're, I, they're horrified on certain campuses. I will say that we have fairly good evidence that on average, you know, men and women are different. And these differences are most salient around sort of courtship and you know, romantic preferences. It shouldn't be a thing. How, it should be obvious. How are we? I sometimes I'm like, I can't believe I'm even having this conversation with people more and more about how they're, they're the boys and girls are different. But I think <laughs> I think that's why the intellectual dark web. You know, people like Sam Harris or um, Heather Hang and the wine scenes and so forth uh, became popular is because we were challenging these things right just saying that doesn't make no. any sense to me and i think it was such a relief to people yeah and factual feminist people said i kind of thought i was crazy yeah because it seemed to me that this could they're be being true. gaslit they are being gaslit they're being and they, gaslit. They, they, they were happy that they realized i yeah because it can't make sense to them it's one of the first i was reading somewhere that it's one of the first things that children learn about organizing the world that oh, yeah. is the boys and girls are different. Absolutely. <laughs> and they play differently. And you see it as early as social play begins. And if there's any difference between boys and girls, that is uh, a cultural universal. that you, you have to suspect that it's driven in part by biology. And especially if you find a difference, like say, play. Typical little girl, the, as early as, as play begins... I like sort of nurturing play or imaginative theatrical play, playing house, playing school. Um, those, you know, ex uh, interpersonal, exchanging confidences with a best friend. Little girls are, you know, very verbal. And they do some rough and tumble play, but not nearly no! as much as boys ever. For boys, more than 90% of them, it's rough and tumble play. Oh, and yeah. they want to do it. All the time. Yep. 
I, and it's a lot of mock fighting and yeah. sounds and swords and pretending and superhero play. It's so important. And there are experts on child development and, and playground dynamics. And they will tell you that this is, this is critical to the well-being that little girls need that play and little boys need their play and that it's wholesome and they're learning about their limits. They're, and you have so many adults now and others they've influenced that they, oh, no, you just have to encourage the boys to play the nurturing play with dolls and get the girls to play with the trucks. They Most of them don't want to, and they don't need to. I I have such a deep resistance, and this is where I question myself is this, you know, I take a step back, and because I have a, I am, this is where I do feel reactionary. I feel very much, um, I that idea I understand gender as a social construct. I see how those things can play out. I'm not blind to the idea that that there are certain ways in which things are encouraged for women and men that are different. Okay. I can accept parts of that. Part of it. It's partly cultural. Right. And of partly course. biological. And the nature and nurture. I mean, it's one of the oldest questions in the entire world. But to think that we in one generation are going to undo thousands of years of evolutionary biology (laughs) is just crazy to me. Well, to think that we're going to undo it and why assume that we should? And every time humans try and intervene, there's, it ends up being a problem. You see this in China with the one child and then they had a lack of girls and now there's a massive population of men and not enough women and it's causing huge societal problems and well you see experiments and something runs very deep in human nature like say the the mother child bond so occasionally you've had experiments in society separating mothers from children like you've had it in in uh the kibbutzim in israel Mm -hmm. early on they wanted to have these totally socialist kibbutz They would have the children, the babies raised separately. And the mothers were just supposed to be mothers of all the children. And it drove mostly women crazy. Oh, I bet. And they would find ways to sneak and try to get jobs where they would be. They wanted to be with these babies. Right. And um, their babies. With their babies. Right. So you you want to be very careful. Any society that wants to flourish and have you know successful happy <laughs> citizen you do not want to separate mothers and, and their and their babies and another thing that i see is a, i think a child has a right to their gender identity and a little boy it, there are exceptions and we need to have a society that teaches understanding and tolerance and that not everybody's the same right and so i do that, that's something very positive that's come out of the I agree. gay rights movement mm-hmm. and just, you know, not, don't let kids be so mean and right. make them understand. And be, but what they've done is instead of teaching kindness and understanding and that there are, there's variation, they've kind of um, pathologized traditional uh, boy, boy, right, right. boyness. Masculinity, so or you traditional boys, girl, uh, girlness. girlness, yeah, girlness. Yeah. Like I was a girly girl, and um, you know, had just a, a revulsion for most of the, my brother's toys, and just loved my bride doll, yeah. my dollhouse, <laughs> uh, my girl toys. But there was this kindergarten teacher I will never forget, because she was a, a genius, uh, Vivian Gusson Bailey uh, Paley. She won the MacArthur Genius Prize. So this wasn't just your everyday kindergarten teacher. Right. But she wrote a book about little boys and girls play. And she said some mothers were worried the boys were doing superhero play and casting themselves in these important roles and aren't the girls losing out. And then she looked very carefully at the doll corner and she said, you know, the girls have power games of their own uh-huh. that are in a, in just as formidable as the boys and who gets to be princess who gets to be mommy you know the whole thing it, but she said they were more subtle mm-hmm. <laughs> and a lot of the um power dynamics were were hidden mm-hmm. but they are there they're definitely this is one of the things too that drives me crazy and i i, I don't 
It's so hard to say without sounding callous or or like when I hear a lot about these, the Aziz thing, for instance, oh. was a good example of no one's really talking about how women manipulate men using sexuality and they absolutely do. I've done it. I've used my sexuality to manipulate men and and it would be very easy for me to go back and be like, oh, I was oppressed or, oh, I was taken advantage of. Well, that's what I like, to, I like to ask a lot of women who, oh, well, a man did this terrible thing. Okay, count the times where your sexuality, you know, someone was had an exploitative a- a- attitude and tried to manipulate you or hurt you. And then just compare that times where you have used your feminine wiles to your advantage. Yeah. And just, let's just do, let's be honest. No. And they it can't that, be. It can't be. It's really. Because you know why? It's a game. And if you look at women's games and men's games, with women, we said there is more sort of hidden and covert dynamics, you know, power dynamics. And I think women continue to do that. So now we're pretending to be just, you know, women in distress, damsels in distress, and we're we're so weak and we're <laughs> taking to advantage of the power. And then grabbing the power. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, part of me is like kind of it's kind of awesome. I mean, I see it sometimes and but the reason that I don't cheer it on is because it's it, the way that they're doing it and they're so unpleasant. I don't like this mean girl feminism. No, I hate it. And it's powerful right now. Mm-hmm. And they're just so take the Aziz thing. The thing that was most salient to me about that was just how mean she was. Uh-huh. She shamed this guy for no reason, humiliated him. Mm-hmm. And just imagine yourself in that position and that someone, something so intimate and just this date and he was trying to impress this girl. It may be, you know, who knows what was going on. And then she just makes him look like such a well, a loser. I think I tweeted something and actually it was like, I hate when I get naked and a man thinks I want to have sex with him <laughs> during that Aziz thing. Because that's, you're upstairs with a famous guy, you're naked. I, I, don't pretend you don't understand what's going. It's not. It's, and don't pretend like he's in, oh, he's interested in me because of my, I'm, a, I'm I don't know what she was, my writing or something. Like, come like, on, ladies. <laughs> uh, you, you're not that, that dumb. And it, it, I don't know. I no, get you're fr- not that fascinating. You know, that it, it just be real. I get frustrated because I, I do feel, I wrote a piece about uh, the seven stages of a woman's scorn. And the men's rights activists have written blogs about this piece, about how it shows that I'm just like this crazy <laughs> slut who deserves to die, blah, blah, blah. But really what I was kind of pointing at was that I'm I, I'm oh, I was talking about how I weaponized my sexuality, how I these these phases that people go women go through, but I was kind of pointing to the idea that, you know, women aren't innocent to act like it and, and again, this is the the weird flat losing of agency and acting like women are just these infallible beings who never do anything wrong and just listen to us, believe us, because we don't lie, we don't cheat, we don't do any of these things right. that men do. And, and we don't, it's bullshit. It, 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 I think back to high school, different era, but I was living in Westwood. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the girls, um, some of my <laughs> friends, wanted Hollywood guys. I mean, ri- they were 16, 17, <laughs> and they were... They would throw themselves at these guys. Mm-hmm. They would we'd go to parties with these older guys, and I I would see, and uh, they were very aggressive, and 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 cal- we were calculating and like what? Well, let me just put it this way: I did not get the sense of women as sort of these damsels that were needed protection. I was at the Playboy Mansion after all this stuff came out, and Brett Ratner was there. And women were literally going up to him, showing him their headshots and flirting with him. This is after all this stuff came out about what a douchebag he is. But these like, guys are used to you. These, it, to act like some of the, and this is, and I'm not saying that like in the Weinstein case, there is obvious, um, he, there are men who obviously abuse this. But there are also women who abuse the fact that they're beautiful 
and they they want to get something like a role and they're using their sexuality to try and do that. And then when you, that doesn't work out to turn around and act like you're a victim is dangerous to people who are actually victims. But actually, I think you say using your sexuality, and that's true, but sexuality and youth and beauty, they, they, those are powers you possess. Of course, they're like and young superpowers. And women have power of, of just their... I'm not saying it's a bad thing using yeah. your sexuality. <laughs> I mean, it's just life, and yeah, people have to be humanity. People have to be kind, and they have to have limits and all of that. Uh, but on both sides, I mean, right? Women have to. Men have their vulnerabilities, and women can destroy oh, men yeah. in so many ways. But and I just think that we're very well matched. I don't think that uh, Mother Nature or our culture wanted to. Uh, develop a system where one could just destroy the other i think men and women are well matched and i think that vice and virtue uh neither sex has a monopoly on either Mm -hmm. you find great heroism and goodness and just uh, virtuous behavior in men and women Mm -hmm. and you find vicious cruel destructive uh personalities in both sexes yeah so I don't. Uh, I see that we're we're different, but very much. E- there is that common equals. humanity. Yeah. yeah, it's so. What this podcast was kind of developed, or I conceived of it because I I do see the victim culture, and I want to talk about grit and resilience. Essentially, so one of the things that I ask most of my guests is, "What was your personal kind of?" dark night of the soul in your life and you don't have to get into it if you don't really want to but what was there a moment where you really had to dig deep in yourself to overcome either hardship i've had like 10 so (laughs) or can you think of one or well it it, i mean for me it's you know i lost my husband Mm -hmm. and a few years before that, my father, mm-hmm. and this year, my mother. Wow, I'm sorry. And it's just uh, because I did have a sort of, you know, charmed life uh, as a child and nice parents mm-hmm. and the men in my life. I mean, my father, my brother, my most of my boyfriends, my husband were supportive and mm-hmm. just enjoyed my success mm-hmm. and encouraged me in, in, to, in, to do things that I was sometimes afraid of, and they would Tell me, and my father would just, you know, I'd do something and wasn't successful. And he says, he says, if you're not failing at things, sometimes you're not trying hard mm-hmm. enough. You know, you've got to, you know, failure, that's a measure you're trying. And it's just, he would tell me these things. And so I will say that now, like getting older and realizing the absolute finitude that he's absolutely gone. And I mean, and my mother, and, you know, it's just, um, it hasn't been dark, but it's been. Chase, it's just, um, I just have had more um, of confrontation with the reality of mm-hmm. human mortality. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, but it, it sort of makes me f- feel worse about where the culture is right now because I worry that the educational system and even the way men and women are relating and different ethnic groups are relating, there are patterns now that are, Gonna, people are going to spend a lot of waste. They're going to waste a lot of time right. instead of embracing life. Right. And all just the the glory of existence and the diversity and just being open hearted mm-hmm. towards other people, mm-hmm. towards other cultures, towards the world. I see a closing in mm-hmm. and a shutting down. And then I see these college students, some of who are, are in the most beautiful places on earth. The, the the centers of opportunity, you know, Wesleyan University, Boston, Swarthmore, yeah. you know, at, on, on campuses and at, at Stanford, Harvard, and they're turned inward, mm. and they have this 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 dark vision about reality. And mm. I just want to say, honey, go life for a is walk, short. <laughs> yeah, go bird watching, or go to as <laughs> the symphony, or go look at art, and don't look at men as threat, you know. These are your lovers having yeah, adventures yeah. and all these rules. I'm worried about 
I mean, one of the most ecstatic experience in life is adventures with with the opposite sex. Yeah, if you're heterosexual and having just sublime encounters. And now I worry that people are gonna we're gonna have this hyper puritanism and a fear of one another. And um, to me, that is closing rather than opening opportunities and doors to to life. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to continue for a few more years. Uh, I keep thinking, well, I just want to stop doing this because it's, you can't. It's exhausting. I know. And, you can't, and though. You go, we need you. <laughs> I know. We need your voice. <laughs> but, but I understand. I do. Yeah. I no, mean, because even being with these people can take you down because oh, you yeah. have to. My sister is a psychologist. She just says, well, let's, don't, let, don't go there because it takes you into this dark place. But I have ways of getting out. And that, That's that, good. Uh, I've been doing this, working on this big piece about self-censorship for a while and collecting all the emails and reading everyone's accounts. And I, my cousin basically has only allowed me to do it for an hour or two at a time because it puts me in such a dark place. Yeah. She came into my office and I was just in the corner on my futon and I, she's like, okay, you can't do this more than two hours a day. And because it does, there is, it's, I think that same sensation that the uh, culture is shifting inward and the darkness, it's a darkness. Yes. I'm like, there's something I can't, it's imperceptible, it's insidious. And I agree it's, that it's, you feel like, is this how it felt like with the, as we entered the dark ages. Yeah, that's called. what it feels like. It is this. It's, <laughs> the fall of Rome. <laughs> it does feel regressive. It feels like. Uh, no, and I feel like I, 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 it doesn't give you solace. Like, oh, it was such a glorious time when I was young. And now it's not uh, because you miss it. And I, I feel somehow like maybe I was just lucky that I lived through this period where people could be free and happy. And it wasn't as complicated and. And that would be the, like the nineteen. It was just fun to be young and alive mm-hmm. in the like the seventies mm-hmm. and the eighties, mm-hmm. maybe even part of the night. It was just the freest, and and the country was less already. The racism was diminishing, the sex of the uh, homophobia and all that. So there was a, just a feeling of freedom, mm-hmm. radical freedom. But lots of groups were, you know, just. I wonder destined. if humans just can't handle freedom. <laughs> <laughs> there's something in us that uh, can be harnessed by poor leadership mm-hmm. and right now there's a battle for leadership and that's why I was just very crestfallen by what happened at Harvard mm-hmm. because there they could have held the line but allowing mm-hmm. that dean to be mm-hmm. pushed out of his position you see the lines are falling yeah. I know and that these was- are people that should have known better it was an opportunity to teach undergraduates about the Grit. critical importance of <laughs> due process, due process yeah. and that everybody has a right to a defense mm-hmm. and that we have a long history of people taking it, it with uh, you know and after lots of criticism even john adams defended the sh- the soldiers mm-hmm. in the so-called boston massacre yep. and this came he up was yesterday. held you know in, to be reprehensible and he said i think of all the things he did at the end of his life that was what he was most proud and that's sort of deep in our tradition that's part of this these sort of sacred doctrines of democracy and people don't know that and harvard should know that yeah so i agree that i don't want to be too negative because it's not that bad yet but there's some bad no, there's signs. something yeah it's weird it's hard for me because i'm very much like you i try to i err on the side of expecting the worst and hoping for the best it's just my kind of natural defense uh which is why i wasn't really surprised when when the election results came in i was like i i'd, I'd already seen this tide of you know like you said poor leadership but fear and whenever you see someone Fear mongering when that when fear mongering starts on all sides, and I see this. Well, I actually thought at the time, and and Brexit was a big sign for me. Yeah, but but with the election of Donald Trump, it I was concerned about 
the quality of our educational system. Mm -hmm. And I can understand his appeal, Mm -hmm. just as I can understand there's something in human nature that resonates on, you know, for the far left and demagogues there. Mm -hmm. Um, But it just felt to me like people didn't, had not been taught to respect our our democratic traditions Mm -hmm. and when when donald trump was you know indulging in you know uh what i thought were appeals to sort of our worst instincts and bigotry and so Mm -hmm. forth and got away with it and people thought it was funny now i know a lot of people voted for him not not because of his personality but despite the things he would say because they cared about other issues yeah or they really didn't like Hillary yep, and they ch- chose the that. lesser of two evils, or they cared about some other some issue that he, they thought he was better on. Um, but still, I was hoping that one thing could come out of the current political environment, and this may still happen, is that liberals and conservatives could agree that we should strengthen the way we teach American history and teach it in a way that promotes attachment mm-hmm. to the country and love mm-hmm. of the country's mm-hmm. best ideals and um, and how the government works, mm-hmm. because there are too many people who say, "Oh, we can get rid of you know, you know the the electoral college, the electoral college." Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, the electoral college. There's a reason we have it. And yep. It's not because it's racist that's yep. been disputed. <laughs> and uh, be very careful about being careless with with the First Amendment. Yeah, and there we want to see basic civics i guess i don't know if that'll save us but i I do think we're paying a price for having um, a very uh um inadequate educational system and character there just seems to be a a loss of um decency and that is concerning to me i don't know i think that we actually have a lot of decency uh, but people are just misinformed misguided and now anybody that's impassioned some impassioned social justice group or a group on the right can come with all these you know fake statistics Mm -hmm. and phony studies and persuade you Mm -hmm. and it's almost as if we've just got all these dueling conspiracy Mm -hmm. theories about how bad everything is that's the darkness (laughs) <laughs> that I keep feeling, you know, that like the when you see fear mongering, conspiracy theories gaining traction, these are all bad signs. <laughs> they are bad signs, except that I, you know, I look, here's what gives me hope is we're talking about these things that worry us and I see what's happened at Harvard and crazy things that happen on some of the campuses I visit. People like Roxanne Gay with these just casually saying the most erratic things mm-hmm. about negative things about a men in American society. But then I look at the real world. You know, I'll go yeah. into Washington, D.C., or even just walk around Town. the campus. Mm-hmm. People are pretty nice to each mm-hmm. other, mm-hmm. maybe nicer than ever. There is less bullying mm-hmm. in the society. Mm-hmm. Very importantly, I read there's a lot, appears to be a lot less child abuse. Mm-hmm. And people used to be pretty horrible to children, mm-hmm. and some still are, but it's not, as normal as it used to be, and crime, violent crime is down, Mm -hmm. including rape and murder, down, way down, Mm -hmm. in ways which are confusing to to criminologists. We can't quite explain it. So there's something good going on, and some of it may even be that the, the progressive left, even though they would sometimes go too far, sometimes they did correct bad tendencies in the society and open the eyes to of course behavior that was denigrating or limiting to to other groups so i think that we've benefited you know and it shows in the sort of everyday life even of the campus Uh uh-huh and that gives me hope that's good that gives me hope but that's why you and i and everyone else still has to work to have hold the line hold the line (laughs) yeah and remind people that there was a reason we got here. Yep. There's a reason that these good messages got through. It was free speech. Yes. And it was respect for the past, learning for the past, not you know, not discounting someone because of their race or their discrediting them because of the power of their ideas. Right. The charisma of their their thinking. And that's what we have to work for. Mhm. I think to, for younger people to be inspired 
and with with love and curiosity. Mm-hmm. That's really the that's the that is the thing I hope to see is, and I see it in in my n- my nephews in that generation. They're le- they don't seem yet as cynical as the generation that seems to me to be very cynical. And but you've got to do something. We've got to save the girls because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I think women in a women sort of call the shots mm-hmm. in a. It's just a, a civilized society will give women their voice and their uh, opinions matter. And women vote more than men in this mm-hmm. society and just in many homes. Mm-hmm. And I grew up in a home mm-hmm. where I think my mother may have had more of a say. On oh, things. yeah, I, definitely. And you talk, uh, most women are kind of in charge of paying the bills and the, fi- you know, when you t- uh, in the household, there's a lot of. Yeah, just power. We've power. got a lot of power. We do. And, and, you know, we can, if we want something, um, we can sort of get it. You yeah. know, you work uh, or you network and you get it. And men aren't organized. And they will just sort of, I mean, it's yeah. sort of on us. Yeah. And I think that this is a big challenge for old fashioned equality feminists like myself and uh, my allies like Camille Paglia mm-hmm. and people like you and Claire mm-hmm. Lehman and many others. Um, is to fight to at least have an opportunity to show young women that there's an alternative mm-hmm. to a grievance and and the sort of fainting couch style so of weird. femininity, which is so it's the weirdest conflict weird. to me. It's so I just have strange. a hard time getting my mind around it. The empowerment of of being, being infinitely aggrieved and victimized and and it's not empowered triggered by the first hint of male vulgarity it's just so weird what is that and it's just so the, i ask the same two questions of every one of my guests at the end what is your biggest defect of character or personality trait that you have to work against oh there are a few but uh <laughs> one is um i'm i have it very hard to resist temptations and to uh, fortunately, I don't smoke, but I smoked for many years, mm-hmm. and now I'm addicted to Nicorette. Oh, okay. I like it, and I yeah. can't find anything wrong with it. But I mean, I, I and I just started it for no reason because I had <laughs> quit smoking, and I just, you know, I can't, I don't exercise, and I just don't enough. So I'm, um, I'm self indulgent, mm-hmm. and I really hate to be uncomfortable. And my late husband just didn't mind. He would have been a great Marine. He didn't care if it was too hot. or He didn't notice. Yeah. <laughs> and he had no fear. Yeah. And once, just as a joke, it was her, in the middle of Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> and I just wanted to see. It was. A, I went down to him and said, let's go to New Orleans. Mm-hmm. Let's go right now. Let's just like, there's no flights where we could take the car. He says, are you crazy? There's a hurricane. I said, it'll be fun. He said, oh, okay. And he would have done it. I said I was kidding. <laughs> anyway, I'm sort of a uh, the opposite. I'm frightened of things. Mm. And, you know, I would never. I, I just I don't like that in myself that mm. I'm timid and self indulgent. And that's enough. <laughs> yeah. And what's your biggest asset? I think it's that um, I have a sunny disposition, mm-hmm. and I'm. Uh, my now my good friend Sally Sattel, I wrote a book with her called One Nation Under Therapy, and uh, with with Sally, you're just you know, um, she's with you. you. You spend a little time with her, and you'll get your diagnosis. <laughs> she can die. She's a very good doc. And she said to me, "Well, you're just a manic depressive without the ma- without the depression. You're just like you're always <laughs> like the mania. I, I'm yeah. always happy. So I'm a little like that, but." It, makes you feel pretty good most of the time and I don't get depressions and things like that and I know what that is because members of, close members of my family mm-hmm. get that but um, my father had what I have and his mother did so it must have come through that line but just a happiness mm-hmm. uh, sort of a, a my happiness set point yep. it's easy for me to get there oh that's so. great We'll bring it into the world. (laughs) We need it. Thank you so much for the time. This is amazing. And I hope everybody follows you. Where can we find you online? Well, you first of all on Twitter at C.H. Summers. Summers with an O. -S O M M E R S, And the Femsplainers, where I co-splain the world with my pal and best friend for life, Danielle Crittenton. Danielle Frum. She uses various names. And uh, the Factual Feminist. Great. 
Well, I hope you do more of those because we need those as well. And uh, we'll we'll find you online and and keep look forward to you holding the line. Yes, and you, you too. And, and keep on doing what you're doing. Thank so. you. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Well, hello, Bridget. I've been a very bad girl. <laughs> yeah, we missed last week's check-in because... You were away, and we couldn't squeeze it in before you left. In we did try hard, people. We did try. It was Game of Thrones night. And nothing interrupts Game of Thrones night. Nothing. And now it's over. With a big, giant meh. <laughs> With a big, giant meh. Exactly. How dare they? Yeah, so you were in D.C. Mm-hmm. And what were you doing there, Bridget? Tell the people. Just on my conservative media darling tour that's <laughs> never ending. You did a couple podcasts, right? I interviewed, well, I was there to interview Christina Huff Summers, right. this week's podcast. Which was fabulous. I loved it. I love her. She's who I want to be. <laughs> yeah, right? She's who we all want to be. She's one of those old She's school She's hated feminists. on the left, though. Hated. Ugh, she wrote a book about the war on boys. Yeah. Um, and it's all about a lot of what we spoke about. Right, right. And yeah, she's really, really hated. That and then doesn't make any sense to me. Last week, actually, the day that I interviewed her, I went online and I follow on my sane people list. Mm -hmm. It's not really all sane people. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is I follow some like really far left, uh, like the extreme left so that I can see what's going on in that that side of the world. Right. And today, they or that day, they were talking about how her name and abortion, how she's basically like, a f well, okay, there's the extreme left, but then there's this new faction that's popped up in the culture wars. And they're... Like the anti-intellectual dark web people. Oh boy. <laughs> so they're the people that are, it's like every day there's a new group of people attacking centrists. I'm so glad I have you to explain this all to me. Well, this is the, it, well, one of the guys who seems to be kind of leading this charge is he's an intellectual. And then it's like, I would say they're probably center left. Mm -hmm. so, yeah probably center left and they think one of the arguments uh the the argument of oh i basically abandoned all my leftist principles and became a right right wing shit lord or whatever they say essentially anyone like me who's calling myself centrist is really just a republican and it's not true no but they were criticizing her, this little faction that likes to take on the intellectual dark uh -huh. web in particular. They were criticizing her for, they searched her name and they never saw her name and abortion together. And they were like, if you are calling yourself a feminist and you've meant, never mentioned abortion, just like get the fuck out of here. You're not, you're not, in a, you're not a feminist. Ugh. I hate this idea now that everyone's expected to weigh in on everything and everyone must have an opinion on everything. And if you don't publicly declare what your opinion is or where your stance is, yeah. then you're called out for it. That's bullshit. You can talk about what you want to talk about. That's feminism. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I understand it's the ability it. to just, choose. <laughs> yes. To talk about what you want to talk about and where you want to be silent and make your own decisions about your life. I hate the, two, the thing too that it, there's this pressure on the left for people to shout their abortion and then there's this pressure on the right where it's where it's basically calling anyone uh who's had an abortion or defending it a baby killer which seems like the last week was tough with the news cycle yeah. because i think that there are a lot more people who might be in the middle uh, who live in nuance on this topic where they've had one i remember when i went to church with my mom once and we were all looking the the priest had was going railing after women who had abortions for some reason. It was like a St. Patty's Day <laughs> service, which was I for some reason weird. He just was an Irish priest and mm -hmm. he was really going hard. 
And I was looking around and wondering how many women in that church had abortions and were sitting there listening to this. Right. And thinking that's not a persuasive or compassionate argument. No. I don't think most people go into abor- abortions thinking I'm killing a baby. No, you know? and, and <laughs> most people don't skip off to the abortion clinic either with not a care in the world. It's, no. a, it's an incredibly heart-wrenching decision. So it's that, a personal choice for every woman. Yeah, and in that, uh, in that experience of everything becoming more fl- the, the, the partisan tribalism that's flattening every argument and destroying nuance... You have the group that's basically the shout your abortion group that's kind of they feel pressured to a lot of people, I think, feel pressured to shout this. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, I just see it's uh, I think there are probably a lot more people that they might be able to persuade not to even necessarily be pro-life, but who probably lean more in that direction for themselves, maybe Mm -hmm. not necessarily for anyone else. Mm -hmm. As I like to say, pro-life in the sheets and pro-choice in the streets. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yet another fantastic (laughs) slogan (laughs) coined by Bridget. (laughs) I'm pro-life in the sheets and I'm pro-choice on the streets. What does that even mean, Bridget? I don't know. (laughs) But it sounds good, doesn't it? It's, but I do think there are a lot of people who are now who probably would wouldn't make that choice for themselves, but wouldn't also hinder anyone else from making that choice. Right. And I feel like when you're attacking people, it's just such a weird way to try and persuade. No, people. T- t- attack. Oh, people it's just is the baby never, killers yeah. wanting to kill more babies. OK, you like sh- just stop. That's such an unnecessary way to ta- to tackle this argument and ineffective. Uh huh. It's never that you're never going to win people over. Shout your, your abortion or basically shout about your abortion and, and stand up for abortion or basically you're not a you're not a feminist mm-hmm. and you're kicked out. OK, that's not effective. either. No, no. You've both lost the plot. Yeah. If you don't think that you should you can abort a baby up till nine months, you're out. Well, OK, no, no, <laughs> that's no. These choices are so insane. No. And, and it's like it's they're so extreme one way or the other. It's just like that's why there's so much room in the center for people to like find their way to agreeing on shit. But it's, that is apparently being lost. Oh, yeah, it's gone. It's funny, too, because I keep hearing from publishing houses and whatnot that there's no center. <laughs> I know. And I'm like for a group <laughs> that's constantly under attack. From uh-huh, both sides. Uh-huh. And I mean, AOC is constantly tweeting about the center and how it's all bullshit right. and blah, it's blah, just blah. just because the left and right, the extreme left and right are the loudest. So they're getting but, the most attention. But for a group that's constantly attacking the center, who are these invisible people that don't exist? Right. If we don't exist according to publishers I mean, and demographics, demographics apparently. and people, uh, the television ratings. It's so bananas. It's a weird world. So yeah, I, I did that, and then I did I did uh, Matt Lewis's podcast, mm-hmm. which I probably will be dropping maybe before this even comes out or the same day. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I feel like I'm probably gonna get dragged for some of the things I said on there. <laughs> <laughs> you can't open your mouth without getting dragged. For well, something. and I was joking, which is always the <laughs> the danger. Because they take little one, two line snippets to use to pro- or just a couple minute clips to use to promote the podcast, right. which is terrifying. Right. And I know for a fact that at one point, one of the questions was, how do you talk to liberals? Very far <laughs> left liberals. <laughs> and I was just saying that I just ask a lot of questions and try to stay on point with whatever the premise is. Mm-hmm. But I was saying that, you know, I, I I was thinking of a conversation I had recently with a friend where he was just all talking points, clearly Trump is Hitler. Mm-hmm. And I was and I said, you know, I just try to say things like I I hear that you're saying Trump is Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> And how does that make you feel? No, and I was like, <laughs> and so tell me, why do you think we should turn in all of our guns? <laughs> because it is this weird cognitive dissonance where I don't understand that conflict at all because it's always the same people are like, Trump is Hitler and right. we need to like confiscate all the guns. Right. Okay, well, which one is well, it? Well, you, don't you want to uprise against Hitler? Isn't that the problem? It doesn't make any sense. 
And I feel like I can totally see stupid little me making that joke under a little banner that says how to talk to liberals. (laughs) (laughs) So keep your eyes peeled for that, folks. (laughs) I'm not saying that that's what's <laughs> definitely going to happen, but I am you have a feeling feeling like it might. That's really funny. Yeah, because they were like, oh, we got plenty of what sound bites from you. Of course, you're oh, like great. made to produce sound bites. Like pro-life <laughs> in the sheets <laughs> and pro-choice on the streets. <laughs> She's going to make up a jingle about it, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm going to make a meme. Some kind of Game of Thrones meme. Well, welcome back. We're happy to have you. Yeah, those things are always terrifying. Mm -hmm. Especially because I still have no idea why anyone wants to talk to me. It's because you give them great sound bites. (laughs) I said today on Twitter, if I was a useful idiot, I wouldn't even know it. Because I get accused of being a useful idiot to the right. A useful tool. Mm -hmm. Hey, whatever works. (laughs) Great. We'd like to thank our sponsor this week, Phetasy.com, an online community for the politically homeless. Join Phetasy.com and have fun laughing and dancing while the world burns. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs) 